Thank you, Jason. Another great presentation where we really get to drill down to a much more local level and, and see this, see, see these case studies and see what the, the impact is and some of those levers that uh, Jason was describing being able to pull. Now, we, we are over time, but I, I just we can't have a session like this without having a few questions. Um, would anyone like to ask a question of any of the panel? Yes, sir. Um, I don't know that there's a, um, a sort of a study which has actually assessed that, but, but one of the, the things I'd, I'd say is that, um, for example, uh, Jason put up a, a graph there which was the difference between rainfall and potential evaporation, so it's rainfall minus PET, and that was going down in, in all of those different uh, climate models. And, uh, and that's going to be a key driver both of surface water and of groundwater recharge. And so under those scenarios, on average, um, the groundwater is going to go down, so the groundwater access. The offsetting factor there is that as uh, uh, rainfall intensity tends to increase and extreme rainfall increase, so, you know, sort of wetter years uh, becoming, you know, wetter, and so as well as the dry years getting drier, those wet years are really fundamental to, to um, groundwater recharge. So it's actually the balance between those two things, an average drying and those extreme events. And I think the outcome of that will be very, very localised. So in some reason, regions, that will be increased groundwater. In quite a few, I suspect, reduced. Um, uh, the implications for um, accessing that groundwater, I think that's something which we'll just have to uh, um, you know, play by ear, because I think um, uh, these issues will pop up again. I mean, they, they need to be addressed now, um, but they'll probably increasingly be, need to be addressed, just like surface water and the arrangements associated with that will need to be continuously revisited as these futures that Jason was talking about uh, come through. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, look, I'll probably just mention one, and um, actually Barnaby Joyce mentioned it in the opening address yesterday, and it was increasing farm management deposits. Um, I think when you look at this is about sort of broadly about risk management, then obviously having a greater capacity to invest to actually even out to even out some of those income fluctuations is really important. And probably the, one of the good things about farm management deposits, at least at least compared to uh, insurance, is if you don't use it you haven't actually lost anything, it's actually sitting there in a the bank. Um, so I think that was a really, you know, quite a positive move in terms of sort of risk management and encouraging people to actually prepare for change and, and support themselves. So that's, that'd be one, one sort of policy option that I'd sort of nominate as being very positive on the adaptation front. I'll throw another one in. Um, uh, I think that's a, a good suggestion. And uh, another one is in relation to R&D. Uh, so, uh, analyses, including by ABES, by Neil Hughes up the back there, um, has uh, shown uh, long-term changes in the total factor productivity. Essentially, that's the, the increase in uh, efficiency of production uh, over time in agriculture, apart from the last decade or so, where it actually started to go. Instead of going up, it was going down. And that, a lot of that's actually driven by climate uh, influences. And, uh, and at the same time, we've actually had lower and lower um, R&D expenditure. And, there's a long-term consequence of R&D expenditure, and that's reduced total factor productivity, and that happens in Australia and the rest of the world. So one of the key things we need to do is, is keep on providing effective R&D in terms of the amount, um, but also the mechanisms to distribute that and target that. One last question, anyone? 
because I'm dying to ask one. <laughs> um, just very, very quickly, um, over 30 years been talking to, to farmers about these sorts of issues and um, by their very nature optimistic about what they do and really keen observers of what happens and they, they talk about the variability of climate and accept that as being a given. Do you now have a sense that um, there is growing acceptance amongst the agricultural community that what we've been looking at here today is absolutely happening and that they're going to have to adapt? Do you get any sense of that, Mark, in your work? I'll, I'll, I'll pick this up. I've actually done uh, analyses of uh, survey responses from, uh, from farmers uh, and uh, and so pulled it in from different surveys. And, hmm. and the message here is that the um, stated views of farmers uh, in surveys um, uh, are much more sceptical of climate change yes. than the, pop, um, the public average. So in fact, it's about twice as many people say it's not happening or it's not happening, it's not due to humans, uh, compared with the Australian population average. Uh, so the public face <coughs> of farmers is very much uh, essentially um, let's deal with climate variability, climate change is something we don't want to deal with. Um, in reality, when they actually start to um, you know, start to look at the practices and the practice changes that farmers have done, it is actually saying that the climate is changing because the things that they are doing are things that are in response to those changes in climate that they're seeing. And so uh, between sort of 75 and 80 per cent, uh, depending on survey of farmers, actually doing the sorts of uh, adaptation practices that they would do if they believed in climate change or said they believed in climate change. So there's this difference between the stated views and the actions that they're taking. And so, so you need to be very careful about uh, how you interpret um, the things that are coming out of the farming community in that respect. In contrast, the, uh, the peak body, NFF, have been consistent very, for a long time in saying that uh, climate change is one of the big issues facing, facing the industry. And so, again, you're getting a different view depending on whether it's a, an individual <laughs> farmer or a peak body and, and, and the sort of uh, issues that they're dealing with. Thank you. That's a really interesting answer, Mark. I will draw a line here because uh, it is lunchtime. I'm sure you're all very keen to have a feed. But this has been a brilliant session. Could you please thank Joel Listenby, Mark Howden and Jason Crean for their very engaging presentations. <laughs>